First of all, I would like to say a very good morning to President Datuk Ezumi, Club Directors, Dr. Tan, uh, Ichoa, the winners, fellow architects and friends who are spending their Saturday morning with us. Uh, also, thank you to the previous, uh, to the immediate past president, uh, Lediente, who agreed to appoint me during her time as the convener of this competition. And for those who are not very sure what does the convener do, uh, actually, I'm just taking care of the competition, make sure everything is uh, going on smoothly. And I'm in... Uh, I don't do any of the, I'm not involved in the judging at all. Eh? So the competition itself is very challenging in the sense that uh, because it happened during the pandemic, so out of, of the many registrants, I think not, not all submitted, but we have enough to, to have a good competition and good result. Eh? So... I'm sure today is more about the winner of the competition and I'm sure you all are excited to hear from them, their approach, their design process and all that. But uh, I would like to take a few minutes to address the, the house housing issue also because as a senior practitioner, uh, I, I am a stakeholder in this bigger picture of the housing community. So I hope among us architects and graduate students, we please please differentiate between uh, house and housing. It's uh, almost totally different. Even among our friends today, uh, I would say architect Wui, who's very famous for his houses. So he is a house architect. And as for myself, I identify myself more as a housing architect because I have done so many mass housing. Yeah? Uh, I'm just going to present three or four points just uh, for us as the industry player to, to think about it and hopefully it will help in our approach to our work and all that. As I presented during the, during the prize giving ceremony that a lot of the public uh, has this fear about the process of building their home. So... I think we as architects, we have to educate the society the, among our friends to start with, our family members to start with, that maybe building our own house is, is a worthwhile endeavor. You get what you want. Money might be the same as buying it from developers. And uh, it'll be an interesting journey. And also we as practitioners have to make the journey uh, enjoyable and so-called fun for the house builder. Okay, secondly, uh, I want to highlight about the what I call as communal aesthetics among our houses. We as Malaysian at certain age, we will surely consider buying a house and building our own house as what we all dream of in this competition, maybe not, not achievable for many, but owning a house in the community is a bit more possible. But the issue is in our community that uh, I don't think we, we appreciate the communal living as, as much as we should in terms of aesthetics. Because as we go to mass housing area, terrace houses and all that, we can see all these odd color, oddly renovated houses that make the overall outlook a bit undesirable. So maybe again, we as architects, we are stakeholders in the design of these houses. We try to educate, influence how, um, how people should respect the communal aesthetics of the outlook of the house externally and do whatever you want internally to your own uh, whims and fancies, so-called. Yeah? Uh, thirdly, uh, we have to find ways to, to, to convince our client about how things would look like, how space would feel. Because uh, I think most of us here have done, if, if not houses, projects for sure. Yeah? 
that for the layman, it's hard for them to imagine the size, the spatial quality and all that. Eh? So whenever we do detached houses like what we are presenting today, the client will always say, is this big enough? Well, what is seven meter? What, what, seven meter enough for my dining table? And is, is four meter too big for my maid's room? And how about my children's room? Is five meter big enough? So all that question uh, will create anxiety. That goes back to my earlier point that people have this fear about the process. Yeah? So I don't know now, uh, technology is there. Yeah? So the, the simple answer would be a walkthrough and all that. But, but still, we should find ways to, to give a, a more realistic feel to the, to the owner. Yeah? And the, the final point I would like to highlight to, to my fellow architects, graduates and students, uh, be, be, be very sensitive about designing houses and designing housing product yeah? because they are they are totally different in the sense of the economy of scale and things like that yeah? and cost so whatever works well in the house might not work as well in housing project so as the more you appreciate that fact the differentiation between the two that i think you can do better in in both the situation. Yeah? Whenever you, you design a, a single house, you have your single house designer cap. Whenever you design housing, uh, you have a different cap. Yeah? So that's about all I want to share with you all this morning. Uh, it has been a very long journey. Yeah? As I mentioned earlier, it started during Lillian's year and now Dato Izumi is on his second year as president of PEM. Anyway, it, uh, I think obviously the winners are very happy that they, they, they ran the race and they got their first congratulations, a big congratulations to the, to the winners. And hopefully this, this, is, this is an ongoing discussion about what Nation House should be and it don't 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 really look forward about the conclusion about it. Yeah, I mentioned earlier during the press giving. I think it's it's a continuous discussion what Malaysian House should be, what Malaysian House is, and and it it's it's a very interesting conversation that it doesn't matter whether we can define it clearly or not, but it's an evolving product for all of us to work on. So thank you very much again to everybody, especially Secretariat, who worked really hard to get all this done on time, smoothly. And hopefully you all enjoy the morning. Thank you very much. Thank Back you, to Crystal. Architect Ersani Mufti. Thank you. Next, we would like to welcome <laughs> the co-director of Kuala Lumpur Architectural Festival 2020 and 2020-21, Architect Lee Cho War, to give his opening remarks. A very good morning to PAM members, speakers, sponsors, students, and friends. Welcome to another event of KLAF 2020, 2021, the Malaysian House Competition Winners Presentations. KLAF 2020 was launched last year with a big fanfare during Chinese New Year with lion dance and all. It was followed by an a heritage event at Rex KL. Then MCO kicked in on 18th of March 2020 and everything came to a standstill. We stopped the rest of the planned festival celebrations like Raya Open House, Madeka, Datum KL and Christmas Thanksgiving. This year, another Chinese New Year has gone past and Raya is just around the corner. And, KL and the KLAF 2020 team is still working on KLAF 2021. We just had the event last year on the Deca 118. And in fact, we have already planned another KLAF Live on Green in June. And Datum KL and Architects is scheduled to be physical at the end of this year. Let's hope 
the COVID-19 situation will improve quickly for us to end KL AF 2021 with a bang, a physical conference at the end of this year. On behalf of Dr. Tan Lukman, the director of KL AF and PAM, we'd like to thank all our sponsors for the support. We thank GBI, Sika, DEFCO, Blue, Blue Scope Steel, Colorbond, Roca, Johnson Swiss, DML, Prima, Nippon Paint, and HP for their perseverance and continuing support. Thank you very much, all of you, and enjoy the rest of the event today. Thank you. Back to you, Crystal. Thank you, Architect Lee Chowa. Now we would like to invite the three winners of the students' category to give their presentations. Allow me to welcome the third prize winner, Muhammad Alif Zohans bin Johari, to deliver his presentation to Zoom. Good morning and assalamualaikum. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation to Pam uh, to give me a chance to present my work. First, uh, I would like to present, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alif Zulhans. I am a second year student, uh, Bachelor of Science in Architecture, University of Putra, Malaysia. I am a third winner for this competition, uh, student category. Next slide, please. Uh, what if uh, your house and workplace are under one roof. So uh, with the rapid of population in the city, particularly in Clan Valley, available land are exalted. Hence, uh, I propose the flexible house that becomes uh, a key feature to transform our daily life. Housing flexibility offers the possibility uh, of not only spatial and structural modification, but also the ability to be a factor in maintaining sustainability. Uh, this house, sorry, uh, previous slide. This house scheme is related to our current situation that we together facing uh, COVID-19 pandemic has forced most of us uh, to be working from home. Work from home are, are not only because of government mandates, but also as a safety precaution. I will be explaining furthermore regarding to this uh, house scheme in the next slide. First, uh, I would like to highlight uh, two issues. First is exotic available land. There are a bunch of high-rise units like uh, apartment and condo available in the current market to cater the land issues. But uh, the house scheme is only for sheltering people. The second one is this appearance key features of traditional house. As of today, uh, most, mostly design of the terrace house is uh, typical and only function as house and not considering the hot and humid climate and the house uh, is lost their identity. So uh, as design solution, I merged these three elements, work, family, and community into one building proposal. This uh, design purpose acts as uh, both a living space for approximately five people and a working space for artists or painter. So, uh, an art gallery and house has been envisioned which address the microclimate issues and provide ease and tranquility during the process of making art itself. Uh, we Next, uh, for the idea development, this is how I develop my building messing. First, uh, I propose two separate building program uh, which consists of art gallery and house itself. And then uh, I combine that separate element into one building. And lastly, I am tilting the house block to maximize the view. Uh, next slide. Uh, for the space zoning, uh, there's three space zoning. 
uh, first is public, semi-private and private. Uh, for the public, where the art gallery is located, uh, this, this space is uh, where artwork being showcased. And the second one is semi-private for working space or studios. This is space uh, for artists to express their ideas and help a uh, sort of a uh, mini workshop. And the last one is private area uh, where the house, the individual house uh, is located at the highest point of the building because it's more as a private space. Next. And then uh, I adapting the vertical architecture into my design where Chinese architectures and tradition, traditional Malay house architectures are involved. Uh, for the Chinese architecture, I implement the courtyard. This is uh, the important aid to cooling house in a warm weather. And traditional Malay house, I implement the extra space under the floor, under the house, or we call it as a colon. I improvise this space uh, as even space. Next. This is a spatial layout uh, for, the, uh, for the house. On the left side is a uh, ground where the public space are located, the event space and gallery, and as well as uh, studios. On the right side is uh, the spatial layout for a uh, house. Uh, this, as you can see uh, on the screen, there's obvious uh, linear spatial organization for easy circulation because uh, I try to uh, to straightforward for the design because this is uh, only skip for the house. Thanks. So from the layout, spatial layout just now, I uh, come up with this final uh, floor plan that reflect from the spatial layout just now. Next. And then I come up with sustainable solution. Uh, I utilize uh, the good views where uh, it allow to have a different view of environment, nature and people. And then uh, I propose uh, open that to replace the ground use with green land and shrubs. And then uh, I try adapting the basic design solution where natural light, I use a natural light. Uh, the roof are designed with a drop at a consistent interval uh, and then fit with uh, glass and rubbers to allow lighting to come in, in the house. And the last one is open space, where uh, this space creates a well-ventilated environment for the building. Next. Uh, the sectional perspective uh, shows that uh, how uh, these two separate buildings uh, merge into one house. And then uh, this shows uh, the the hierarchy of height of the space. And then on the top right is a facade treatment. I propose a recessed windows. It is, it is to avoid excessive light into the building and create a transition of light that mark as number one in the pictures. And then uh, aluminum rovers to catch uh, maximum natural ventilation and to reduce rainwater splash. Thanks. This house is designed to be a focal point for society. In this case, uh, this house can act as an event space uh, for art, art talk, exhibition, workshop, and so forth. With a clear definition of space zoning, this house becomes a social marker of the nation. On the left side is a uh, illustration of the art galleries. Next slide. 
this is a final outcome of your house. Uh, uh, are you still structure for the main structure of this house? And for the wall, I use drywall to give a sense of light weight for the house. Uh, we are reaching to my final slide. Before I end, uh, I would like to conclude all the key elements of the house into one diagram of my final model for this competition. First, uh, for the roof, I designed uh, it uh, a brick it do uh, several, uh, sorry, uh, the roof is to create a lively roofscape. Uh, and then uh, I propose a open deck to create a visual link. And then uh, there is a ample space for outdoor event. For my design, uh, I design uh, to be universal design. I uh, I design a RAM uh, for easy for different able people to sit to moving around in the house. Uh, next is a multi-function space for the art community, and uh, this space uh, the advantage from the prevailing wind. And last one is courtyard. For the house uh, itself, uh, I create more opening to views out. It is to blurring the boundary uh, between the indoor and outdoors. Yes. Okay, that's all from me. Uh, everyone can scan this QR code for view my other words. That's all, thank you. Back to you, Crystal. Fancy roof. Thank you, Mohamed Alif Zohans. Next, we would like to invite the second prize winning group of Ling Xingqi, Qin Ying, Kui Wai Jian, and Chong Wai Hong to deliver their presentation. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chong Wai Hong. Today, here I'm with my team, uh, Kui Wai Jian, Qin Ying, and Ling Xingqi. So, before I start the presentation, let me start with an introduction of a house first. Next slide. Okay, what is a house? A house is a basic human needs that everyone lives in, conduct our daily life activities, a space for us to do our own stuff with our family member living inside of it. So, an ordinary house in Malaysia usually has a few rooms, one for the parents, one for his son, one for the daughter, and then maybe a living room for everyone to sit on a couch, watch TV, and then a kitchen to prepare meal and a dining area. Next slide. So, in a house where everyone lives together, sharing the same space, however, we will be needing some privacy. Um, personal space, I would like to say like that. Okay. For example, I give an example like that. If the father needs to complete some work in the house, but the mother needs to sleep in the room, so the father goes to the living room, but the children is watching TV. The TV has a lot of noisy sound that can disturb the father's work. So in the end, the father moved to the kitchen to complete his work. Next. Everyone needs some personal space as we grow older. We need more space to conduct our own activity to suit with our lifestyle. So the youngsters are moving out from their family house nowadays. Is a problem or a phenomenon? I would say it's a normal situation nowadays. But we see there's some problems that can cause by this issue. When youngsters moving out from their parents' house, Next slide. When the youngsters are moving out from the family house, the elders are left in the home. Grandparents are getting older day by day. We can see a lot of news happening. Grandfathers or grandmothers fall, fell down in the house and then they can get into some accident, but no one in the house can save them. Or 
if they are getting older, no one in the house to take care of them. No time, end up, they'll send their grandparents to old folks' home. Next. The connection between family members are getting loosened, are getting far apart if everyone is moving out, leaving the elders in the home. So, our design solution, next. Our design solution is to build a multi-generational house. It's the idea of a few generations living in the same house under the same roof. What do I mean by that? We promote the idea of living together, sharing the same space, while we need to enhance the privacy and the personal space that sharing within the house. Thanks. Our design scheme is based on the concept of sharing with privacy, where the key element is to provide the house with sharing space, yet enhance the privacy, as I mentioned just now, to suit everyone's lifestyle with the space that we design in the house. So thank you, Ryan. Uh, my name is Cliff Koiwai Jen. Uh, next slide, please. So now the question we want to ask is, how do we ensure privacy when we are living under uh, with our big family? Especially during the uh, coronavirus outbreak, we see that the importance of privacy under one roof, because all the children are coming back, they can study at home, they can have online class, and the workers can work at home. So especially in this time, we can see the importance of privacy under one roof. Um, next slide. Now, I also want to bring out the Malay House as our precedent study because this Malay House is so successful because it is how we should practice architecture. It's all about adaptability. For example, the material they use is locally sourced. Uh, wait, ah, next, ah. Um, the house is on steel because to prevent the flood. And there's a lot of ventilation because we're living in tropical countries. So I want to bring this out because this is and very good example on how we should use our skill, use our knowledge in architecture. So next slide. In most of the Malay house, we have this space called Anjong, at the center of the house. Um, this space is where the family members will gather. They, maybe in the afternoon, they have nothing to do. They just chill here. You also can find this space in most of the Orang Azi house. This is a part of Malaysian uh, culture. Okay, next slide. So we, inc we incorporate this Anjong space at our, in our design. Our layout is very simple. At the center, we have the Anjong. We call it the Anjong. It's one of the most important space in the house Be because it is where the family members will gather and people are where the food will serve. So wherever the food serve, the people will come. This is Malaysian culture. So look at the left, we have the parents' quarter. So where the parents can work and have their space. And uh, on the bottom is the grandparents' uh, quarter. And look at the right side, we have a lot of spaces. We have living room, we have reading corners. And on, on the upper, upper floor, we have the rooms for the children. So we call it a cluster because there's a lot of space together. So next slide. And we not only design our space in two-dimensional manners, we also arrange our spaces in a multi-dimensional uh, arrangement so we can create a lot of privacy and other architectural features in the house using this uh, arrangement. Uh, let me pass the mic to my teammate. He will, she will explain the spaces. Uh, hi guys, uh, my name is Chin Xin. I would like to explain the floor plan for you guys. Next. Okay, this is our ground floor plan. As you can see, the red dotted indication that's our heart, the heart of the house, was the center courtyard of the building. Okay, uh, where it's connect to private spaces uh, and also act as the main space uh, where the family gatherings could have could take place here. Next. As you can see from this perspective view, 
A big dining table is placed in here at the center of the courtyard and also enclosed with two high brick wall and topped with skylight to welcome the sunlight into the space. Next. Next, I would like to explain the left part of the building. As you can see from the red dotted line indication, there will be the grandparents' quarter where we located at the ground floor for their convenience. And also there's a mini garden uh, located here uh, for them to do some gardening or also getting some morning exercise at the mini garden. And then, uh, as you can see from the blue dotted line indication, there will be the maid's room quarter where we located here uh, is because to uh, convenience for the maid is in looking after the grandparents' daily needs. Next. Next, uh, we will move on to the right part of the building. There's a more quiet and relaxing environment over here. As you can find, there are, there's the water features uh, at the middle of the reading area and also the living area. Next. As you can see from this section, uh, you can see we use an open concept space uh, to replacing the ordinary wall by the bookshelf and also the water features. To, uh, this uh, not only allowed the natural sunlight, but also the natural ventilation into the space. Next. Uh, next. As you can see from this perspective view, uh, we provide an open concept common space for them uh, to, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, provide an open concept gathering space for them uh, to gather together over here. Uh, for example, if someone is riding bicycle outside or sitting at the outdoor patio, the open concept common space can interaction uh, can encourage interaction between each family members. Next. Next, as you can see, the kitchen, the guest room, the toilets and the storage are located behind part of the building. Next. Okay. Moving to the first floor, uh, the left part is the parents' quarter, where beside the bedroom, the toilets and the walk-in wardrobe, we also provide a private working space for the parents to do their works without any interruption from uh, their children or any family members. There are sufficient sunlight provided in this space as well. Next. Next, moving to the right part of the building, there's the children's room as indicated in the, uh, by the blue dotted line. And next. Okay, uh, we, beside the children's room, we also created an activity area for the children as kids engage in physical activities, uh, can help them to provide, uh, improve their creativity and also uh, become physically healthier. Next. Beside the activity area, we also uh, provide a hammock place where the children can lay here and read the books. Next. This mechanically reduces the stress by allowing the brain to become clearer and also uh, enhance children concentration. Next. Moving to the second floor, uh, beside the children's room, there's also a rooftop garden we have provided over here to promote urban farming. As one of the great things about the urban farming is the family members can uh, grow their own vegetables and fruits for their daily needs. Next. By looking at this section, this is how the rooftop look like. And yeah, next. Okay, I would like to pass to my teammate. So thank you, Seling, just now. So uh, actually by looking at our floor plan, uh, our grids are actually divided uh, equally and our rooms are placed along these grid lines to achieve their proportion appearance. So we also form voids in between the floors and the rooms in between in terms of height and the placements of the room. This will create uh, the breathability inside the house 
where uh, in terms of ventilation or by visual. So this void actually serve the purpose of enhancing the stack effect of the house while also providing visual connectivity between the floors. For example, if the grandparents, they are sitting at the reading area at the ground floor, they can actually look up to the family lounge area where their grandchildren is or the grandchildren, they can look up to the roof garden to see what their parents are doing or vice versa. So this is another kind of connection we are aiming for in our design through visual senses because usually in our normal houses, we are enclosed by walls whereby parents didn't know what their children are doing at the upstairs and then children have no idea what their parents are doing at the downstairs. Next slide. Okay, so having these voids, we, have, we will create high ceilings and double volume spaces. And usually we have these spaces in our design at in front of the grandparents area, the dining area, and also the hammock area. High ceilings will give us the perception of spaciousness of the roof while also giving natural light and ventilation coming into the room. So it will cool off the building in an efficient way. Next slide, please. So looking at the exterior perspective, we have a large canopy roof sheltering our, our design, our building. So this roof is actually inspired from the Malay traditional longhouse. We extend the roof, the roof eaves significantly to shed our spaces beneath from the harsh sunlight while also giving a transitional boundary between the interior and the exterior. Next slide. Apart, on top of that, we also separate our roof structure roof structurally from the main building to provide flexibility in arranging our spaces in the interior for future extensions for the family. Let's say if they have decided to let them let their uncle to live in permanently with them, they can opt for an option to extend the building, whereby the roof doesn't really affect much of the space. Next. Okay, we instead of using normal brick walls or IC walls, we have decided to use plants as our walls. So we will put a row of trees in front uh, at the front elevation to act as our natural walls uh, formed by the branches. This will create the natural wall, providing air to flow into the spaces beneath, especially at the reading area and also the living area to allow cross ventilation to occur. Again, to allow cross to allow to, to cool off the building more efficiently. Next slide. Okay, at the center part, we also have creeper plants grown along the vertical bar, bars to, sh to, sh to filter the sun rays shining into the dining area. So overall, we use trees as our walls, not just to soften the overall impression of the house, but also giving, giving the, uh, sorry, to also, to also uh, not, not, not giving the house too enclosed or too open. Next. So all in all, in uh, our design, we, our design aims to connect different family members of generation of different generations together, while also providing them sufficient privacy for them to work on their daily life routines and hobbies. And this is all from us. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Now we would like to invite the first prize winner Chong Wei Hao to deliver his presentation. Thank you, MC Crystal. Thank you, Pam. And a very good morning to everyone. Uh, I would like to present to you a Malaysian house is in my eyes called Plant a House from Ground to Ground. So next, next slide. Okay, with our uh, previous one, sorry. Okay, before I start the presentation, I would like to introduce myself. And my name is Chong Wei Hao. Um, I'm from Penang. And currently, I'm taking Master in Architecture in University Science Malaysia. So, uh, as many of you know, uh, whenever we talk about Penang, the first thing always come into our mind is like the image uh, shown. So, it's an urbanized island with a lot of heritage building, uh, streets, hut, and all kind of um, tourism activities happen over here. But in, uh, in fact, I was born on another side of the Penang, which uh, uh, with a totally different image as compared to the island. So I was grown up in a small town surrounded by a uh, paddy field at the north part of uh, Surang Prai called Keplabatas. So next. So Keplabatas uh, is actually not as developed as Penang Island, but for those who are not familiar with uh, Surang Prai Utara, uh, paddy is, is largely cultivated here as a 
uh, most of the land is covered by a uh, paddy field, just like uh, Gada and Police. And so back to the topic, uh, we used to take the traditional Malay house as a representation of a Malay house. But now looking at um, more and more agri agricultural land has been replaced and converted into housing and just like the picture on the right. So a uh, question came into my mind. So is this uh, really a Malaysian house that we want? And is this the future of uh, housing that we are going through? Uh, next. So as we all know, uh, the, the development is unstoppable and we can always see more and more housing like this uh, standing in the middle of a paddy field. And like for me, every time when I drive past the highway with a paddy field on the both side, and then at first I was member mess, uh, mesmer mesmerized by the view itself. But then out of uh, suddenly out of uh, uh, this kind of housing pop up out of nowhere and ruin the whole landscape of the paddy field. But I wouldn't say it's wrong, but I will say that uh, it's out of context. It's like putting a modernized uh, solid urban blocks with a totally enclosed envelope, a solid facade and minimal opening into a rural context, um, and, and hence creating no dialogues between the architecture and the natural setting uh, of the site. So next. So um, it inspired me to take a look at the housing for these agrarian communities, which is not much discussed by, by the industry and the public. So farmers are also a, a play important roles in our uh, part of our society. And of course, uh, we shouldn't forget them as uh, Malaysia too. So just a brief introduction about the demographic of the paddy, field, uh, paddy farmers in Malaysia. So there are currently about 0 0.2 million of farmers in Malaysia, and most of them are considered as B40 groups. And the challenge uh, faced by them are pretty obvious and critical in a way. So farming is uh, no longer an attractive uh, career, for, especially for the young generation, uh, because of the low income and uh, reduction of farmland for them to plant their, to grow their own plants. Therefore, uh, this uh, challenge of this Malaysian house is to address the importance of intergeneration body while tackling the uh, housing affordability issue. And also, uh, the aim of this project is to bring, bring back the color and the identity of Malaysian house while creating a house that shows a strong sense of sensitivity to the surrounding. Next. So the site chosen uh, for this proposal is a hypothetical site in the middle of a field in Penaga, Penang, just uh, a few kilometers away from uh, Kablabatas. So it is a proposal for the future that we might, uh, we can look into. Uh, next. So the whole inspiration comes from the paddy itself, which play an important role in shaping the human culture and tradition, especially for, for us, for the Southeast Asian. So I believe that a uh, paddy can be the rest representation for the Malaysian spirits and culture, just like a phrase in Malaysia, uh, in Malay say, makin berisi, makin tunduk, meaning greater power, greater humility. So combining with the features of traditional Malay house that we always proud of, and it shows a strong sense of humbleness in architecture by having an outlook that touched the ground and blend into the site. So instead of being an alienated object uh, through the surrounding. So uh, besides uh, the design also compensates back the plot of land being used to build this house by incorporating a staggered planter as it, uh, as it building envelope. And this shell uh, not only provide shelter to the occupant, but also allows the farmers to grow their own plants and, and has increased their source of first, uh, food and income. Next. So moving on to the special design. So each space is connected by a corridor-like walkway and hence uh, separate the public and private setting of the housing. Uh, it also encourages the living of multi-generation under one roof by having, having a room at same level with the common area like dining and living. So um, there's a central courtyard in the middle that welcomes uh, more diffuse sunlight and natural ventilation into the house, uh, just like an urban shop house. So it also tends to bring the occupant even closer to the site and bring the paddy into the house itself. And the space for the living, uh, the guest living and the amenity space will be placed on the first floor. And we create a horizontal separation between the host and the guest living. Uh, next. So for this scheme, it's made up of a modular with a size about 8 meters by 4 meters each. So 
by standardizing this modulation size, we can ease the process of uh, mass production and reduce the time for assembly and hence increase the affordability of this house. So especially for the poor. So the same module can be adapted into four interior options, namely uh, living, bedroom, kitchen, and also kids' room with two smaller bedrooms in the same module. So the services and ducting will be go through the, under the elevated floor, and the odd space has been converted into storage and also rainwater harvesting tank that can be used for the hydroponic uh, planter on the envelope. So next. So another feature of this scheme is that the expandability of this house. So it allows the owners to expand their house based on their specific needs and financial condition. Meaning that this Malaysian house is always a flexible and future-proof living uh, solution to the Malaysian where a house can grow from time to time. So we can always start off you know, with a basic unit which uh, made up of only three modules and then slowly uh, grow from a basic family to extended family, even to the multi-family uh, unit with uh, that can accommodate about 10 people living under the same roof. So this house can expand horizontally and vertically by using a simple plug-in mechanism and by having the corridors to connect each, each spaces. So the tubes on the bottom of the module are interlocked with the studs on the top of each module and hence forming a neat construction uh, connection between each module. So by having this uh, ability to expand, uh, we see a future of uh, housing that allows everyone to own a house regardless of the initial size and, and then expand their house uh, from time to time. Uh, next. So since the setting of uh, this house being placed in an agric uh, agricultural land, so it offers an opportunity to us to turn the agricultural waste such as unwanted rice straw into the building materials. So instead of being burned uh, openly, that might cause uh, uh, environmental pollution. So not only making the house more affordable by using these uh, locally available materials, it also creates values for the farmers by selling the agricultural waste to the manufacturer. And we also take this opportunity to, to remind the Malaysian to always think beyond the life of a resource or a material. So besides uh, the hydroponic planters that we can see on the facade of each module are using a simple passive wick system that require less maintenance. So it pro provides option for the farmers to grow their own food uh, off the ground and maximizing the cultivated uh, cultivation area for the paddy. So as mentioned earlier, this uh, Malaysian house is also showcase a few sustainable and innovative green features that we reinterpret from a traditional Malay house. Uh, we elevate the whole building to allow cool wind to pass underneath the building and keep the building shaded by having a pitch roof facing the east. So on the first floor, a uh, continuation of um, full high louvers are incorporated in, into the design to optimize the view and natural ventilation. Uh, we also provide a deep recess for the balcony to, to keep the interior uh, shaded. So as an overall, we create a visual linkage between the interior and the exterior and celebrate the beauty of the nature. So next. So before I end this uh, presentation, I would like to thank again Pam, uh, the competition organizer, jury and lecturers for believing in this uh, design. And, and also uh, let's not forget the contribution of these agrarian communities to our country by having a Malaysian house call, plant a house from ground to ground. Thank you. Thank you, Chong Wei Hao, for introducing us to Kapala Vatas and for your presentation. Next, I am honored to invite the winners of the Corporate Graduate category to give their presentations. Now, I'd like to invite the third prize winner, Architect Loh Yun Lung, to deliver his presentation. Very good morning. I'm Loh from Loh Architect Joe Baru. I would like to thank Pam for giving me the opportunity and a platform to present our design of our version of Malaysian house. Next, please. Okay, our Malaysian house design wish to address two main challenges. The first one is to rethink of our obsession with the appearance of things. A lot of time we spend our time designing a building which is striking in form, mimicking the certain metaphor or even very important. 
Therefore, our challenge is actually to design a Malaysian house that is an antithesis to all this. Can we, as a designer, design a house which, at certain level, is visible? Can we, as a designer, design a house which you don't even see when you're stepping on it? The second challenge of our scheme is to provoke people to see things from a new perspective, to see the undervalues in a new light, and to try using things that commonly known as garbage, to focus on solution, not problems, to encourage people to think globally, but act locally. So the competition brief call for a house which we need to specify a client and a hypothetical site. The client is a young couple who wish to have a small house that can transform through time to suit different stages of lifestyle, family composition, and budget. What they need the most is only a secure and a peaceful shelter that can take refuge in with their offspring. So the site is set on a hilly residential lot with a sloping down terrain occupying most of the land area. Thus, the house will be a self-reliant niche. A niche here means a position particularly well suited to the person who occupies it, is small, is focused, is specific, is known to you, quietly coexist with the terrain. People are increasingly isolated from the natural environment while spending most of their time indoor, trading off their health and well-being. This is no longer just about what building can do for the environment, but rather what the environment can do for the people. Thus, the design seeks to achieve the softer dimension of sustainability through emphasis on ecological connections, coal, energy, and material loops. Next, please. So in, next, in the coming next three slides, I'm going to elaborate three main core ideas of our design. As an overview, the first one is the bio growth. Keeping nature at risk, ensuring little disturbance to the land, the building is carefully arranged on the site without much alteration to the existing topography. Thus resulted a building on steps, which is virtually invisible from uphill, but a food forest that consists of pond, food garden, and neighborhood book sharing library. From downhill, the building envelopes appeals as a secluded niche set within a large greenery. Then we go, the only one and only way to access to the house is actually to go inside the pond. The stairway will lead you down to the hillside depth into the main house, the niche, which is only a small, compacted starter house, consists only of a kitchen and a bedroom. There is a saying, the only constant in life is change. This house is never revealed at once. It's planned in such a way that the spaces are able to transform, to evolve, to unfold through time to suit different family needs. And that is our third core idea, the variations. Before I elaborate further, I would like to share a famous quote uh, from the... Um, a famous quote by Permaculture Advocates, Jeff Luton. You can solve all the world's problems in a garden. The garden here is actually referred to permaculture design, food forest ecosystem that can provide for all human needs while restoring nature. You can solve all your pollution problems, all your supply line needs in a garden. Most of the people today actually do not understand that and that makes people insecure. Most people actually doesn't realize that the most complicated problems today have the simplest solution. Our Malaysian house design encourages people to think globally but act locally. So what is permaculture? Permaculture is actually isn't about those mad hippie lifestyle with no electricity. It's about living as comfortably as you can but not trashing the planet while you are doing it. The great things about permaculture is that it aims to find a solution to the world's problem. For example, you don't have too many snails in the garden, just too few ducks to eat them. It employs good old-fashioned common sense, lateral thinking, which we can sometimes forget in our modern life. Next, please. 
So this is the first view of our Malaysian house. The roof, the bio roof, the roof is actually designed to accommodate a food forest, a rainwater harvesting pond with a small book sharing libraries getting around it. While habitat loss being the greatest threat to the biodiversity in the world, backyard and neighborhood habitats are crucial pieces holding together an increasingly fragmented natural landscape. They hold the potential to create critically needed birds and wildlife habitats. With this in mind, the bio roof is planned not only to feed the family, but also to support the biodiversity by supplying staples such as water and food. And the rest of the site, we intend to just let it go wild with the existing flora. This rewild effort will create the shelter needed for the wildlife and at the same time, reconnect people back to the nature. People are all happier in a deeper sense with life around us, not just our own kind, but plants and also animals too. Next, please. So the bio roof will serve as a platform for turning food waste into a growing medium for edible plants. This is literally converting something which laymen will consider as waste, which will normally end up in the landfill into something that is beneficial to the mankind and the planet. Food forest at the bio roof will allow strip from garden to table. This will generalize the carbon mileage from the harvest of the produce, the packaging, the logistics they have to went through before reaching our plate. This will reduce CO2 emission, reduce wastage, reduce energy spent to preserve the harvest. Moreover, fresh from garden produce has proven to be more nutritional as compared to those bought from supermarket. Food forests also help to build soil too. In image shown here is actually a banana circle. A banana circle is one of the food growing techniques popularized by permaculture practitioners. Banana circles serve as a spot to cycle the constant flow of organic matter, be it in the dropping of the plants or the kitchen food waste. Bananas are very hungry plants. They will actually try off with the abundance cycling of organic material. Next, please. And then the surplus from the gardens is shared with friends and family to foster social interaction and community bonding. I think edible garden could be a great way to bring people together again, encourage conversation between neighbors, exchange of produce and sharing of food. Next, please. So bio roof can also be a place for seed saving. Seed saving is a very important step to maintain the diversity of the species and to preserve their genetic resources for a sustainable future. In general, seeds are either open pollinated or hybrids. Hybrid seeds are bred to specific traits, for instance, for larger yield or for drought resistance, but we can't save hybrid seeds. Helum seeds is safe to preserve food culture. When you save and share seeds, you're actually helping to support everyone's right to control the food supply and become more self resilient Next, please. The bio roof will also serve as a living library where children can learn about nature and joy of being part of nature. Every children has the right to plant a seed, pick a fruit, to know where the winds come from and what weather they will bring. You will find the beauty by observing nature. Frank Rodlight once quoted, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature, it will never fail you. Next, please. So bio roof can also be the place for community book sharing. The idea is simple. Small wooden boxes of books are placed around the garden. Neighborhood, neighbor browse, take one, return later with a replacement. This will further encourage social interaction and sharing of knowledge. We intend to allow the neighborhood to access to the bio roof. When houses in the neighborhood adopt the same sharing idea, the bio roof turned into a catalyst for integration of different races in Malaysia. We are a nation of diversified races. For instance, in the garden of Malay family, you will find edible plants like serai, petai papan. In the garden of an Indian family, you will find plants like moringa, like neem, 
in a Chinese family, you will find leaf plants like sheet potato leaf, citrus like pamelo, and that list go on. Each races have a different preferences on their edible plants because of different lifestyle and beliefs. By sharing the bio roof with the community, bio roof can be a place to communicate, encourage more social understanding, and foster better nation building. Next, please. So this is a rainwater harvesting pond forming part of the bio roof. The pond is designed in a way to serve as a large rain garden. Water collected will be used for irrigation, for aquaculture. The pond will also provide cooling effect to the house. Rain garden also provide habitat for variety of species ranging from insects to frogs and fish. So this stairway, this little duckling is standing, is actually the only way to access to the main house. This will lead us to the next core idea of our design team, the niche. Next please. So across the pond and roof level, a stairway leads to down to the hillside depth and into the main house. The main house, the starter house, consists only a kitchen and a loft above it. We name it the niche. We intentionally downsizing the space, simplify and live with less. Do you really need a three bedroom double story house when only two of you is staying in it? In today's Malaysian society, one third or half of our income is dedicated to house mortgages. We work hard to afford a bigger home that we need. We continue to work so we can fill our house with more stuff and the cycle continue. Can we break the norm of running at the, at the red race? Can we reclaim our autonomy of life? It's all boils down to the mindfulness of contentment. Next, please. Okay. Going small, own less, live more, but why only kitchen and one small bedroom? Kitchen, the place to prepare or cook meal. Why? If you think so, you think again. There is a shift in kitchen dynamics. There is a saying, the kitchen is the heart of the home. Kitchen is the hub of the home. Meals created in kitchen fills body, mind and soul. Some say, while life may be created in the bedroom, it certainly lives in the kitchen. Kitchen can be a place to plan family diet and nutrition to ensure family's mental health. Kitchen can be a kids' art museum. Kitchen can be an entertainment center. A kitchen, working hand in hand with an edible food forest, ensure the well-being of the family member. A simple gesture like grow your own edibles, cook a meal from scratch, preserving the excess, recycle the waste, and make a big difference to the planet. Next, please. So this image shows another angle of the kitchen. The design seeks to achieve flexibility, calm and comfort in terms of space function, visual connections, and also sensing variation of different natural forces. Large operated shutter in front of the kitchen not only to control the temperature and offer shade, but also create an extra the informal semi-outdoor living space. Next, please. So now I will elaborate on the third core idea of our design, the variation. Image shown here is actually the day one of the design, where you can see the bio roof, the starter house, the niche, and the pre-built structural grid. The building on stage highlighted the importance of touching the earth lightly. The roof stage dedicated to the roof foot forest with what to allow for sun penetration. The rest of the site led to be revolved. Theoretically, human habitation is only a space in the air. This strategy ensures that the impact of the house on the surrounding is kept at minimum level. Next, please. Within the parameters set in the pre-built structural grid, the building additional spaces can be built according to the user's need. We are suggesting bamboo as the sustainable choice for future expansion. If you can recall, in my first image of 
the bio roof, I'll show you. There is a portion dedicated to planting bamboo. Literally, the client can grow his own building material. Bamboo grows very quickly with cums suitable for structure, can be harvested within three to five years. Therefore, most probably, when you think of extension after three to five years, you can harvest the building material right from your garden. This will also provide an opportunity for us to learn from the indigenous on the craft and skill of using bamboo, their wisdom of consist constructing using primitive knowledge, less, less machine dependent, can be learned and then passed to the future generation. In the coming slides, I'm going to show you a few um, possible variations from the starter house. Next, please. The first one is actually an additional tree house, a playhouse for the kids, just right next to the kitchen. Next, please. The second one is a possible variation by adding a home office, Soho, uh, next to your bedroom. Next, please. The third one is when the family members increase and the additional bedroom can be added. So in this case, it's three bedroom added. Next, please. So the fourth one is possible to construct another small house identical to the early starter house, but under the same roof for multi-generation living. Next, please. So with that, I would like to conclude my presentation of our design of Malaysian house. Actually, the greatest challenge is not only to innovate technologies for today's environmental problem, but to inculcate the richness of wise ideas and wisdom into today's mind. This is a sensitive shift in trend from biased preference of eye-catching, institutionalized building form to a more organic, humble, yet energy efficient vernacular form. Hence, this is in line with this year's Kuala Lumpur Architect Architecture Festival theme beyond. That's my last question. Thank you. Back to you, Krista. Thank you, Architect Lo Yinlong, for your presentation and that neat proposal. Dear guests, due to some urgent family matters, the second prize winner is not able to share his presentation with us this morning. So kindly accept our apologies for his absence. Finally, I would like to invite the first prize winner, Li Ma Jing, to deliver his presentation. Um, thanks for that, Crystal. Uh, a very good morning to Dr. Tan, Architect Li, Dato Architect Azumi, Architect Norzaini, and uh, Architect Oi, and the KLAF team, and to all. I uh, hope everybody is staying safe at home. Uh, a huge thank you to Pam and KLAF for allowing me this uh, amazing opportunity to present my entry. So it's a great honor to be here today in the presence of some very established names. I'm very humbled by the jury's recognition of my work, for which I'm very excited to show you today. Um, the open house um, was a manifestation of my experiences and understanding of what it's like to be Malaysian and delves into inquiries and subjects of unity, diversity, inclusivity, and community. So um, when I first saw the brief um, shared to by a friend uh, on WhatsApp, it got me very intrigued uh, because something about the title of the competition kept me constantly thinking. The Malaysian House, what an interesting choice of words for a competition. Because it isn't about the Malaysian home, but the Malaysian house. And the first thing that came to my mind was, what is a house? So next slide. Yeah, and uh, that very simple inquiry alone helped kickstart the entire process for me. So I started looking up dictionaries um, translations even, uh, interpretations of what a house could be. And what I found was it really was up to interpretation, as it could mean a lot of things. Uh, next slide. So, uh, next slide. Yep. So Cambridge Dictionary alone has 10 different definitions of the word house. So I settled for one, which I felt could allow me the freedom to continuously express its definition while I was going through um, the design process. 
So a building in which people meet for a particular activity. So something about the definition which is very open-ended and vague really enticed me to explore further. And so I did. Uh, next. So uh, what is a house and what a house could possibly mean? So in, well, in, in the Malaysian context, a curry house is a house. Next. Well, a uh, theater is a house. It's a picture house. Next. So a tea house. Next. So even a, a place for representatives could be a house. Next. Uh, next. So even a place for worship is a house. Uh, and, and you know, the list goes on and on. But what I realize is that um, if we look beyond the, the house as a word to describe a dwelling, uh, it is a word used for a lot of very civic institutions and public buildings. Um, thus, the architecture is highly centric focused with a lot of porosity. So, uh, next slide. So, I mean, this is just one example of what a, what a house looks like. Uh, this is the, um, the National Mosque. So, it has a lot of porosity, high transparency. And uh, this, opened, this really opened new doors in my inquiries and made me want to have a very civic minded approach. Uh, to this project. So next. So civicness was, was something that was uh, going for um, uh, in this project. Uh, uh, next. So the next thing I was asking myself, which is perhaps the more important question, was what is Malaysian? So I started with what I know. Uh, next slide. Which was Malaysia only existed after 1963. And to really have a feel of what Malaysia was like at its purest during her infancy, I was looking at buildings which were manifested during the time. So this is the parliament. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the Subang Airport, which was built in 1965. Next slide. So the Chancellor Building in UM. Next slide. And the National Mosque. So um, what I realized is that the image of a, a Malaysian building, look, you know, it, it doesn't really... Uh, well, basically, what, what a Malaysian building looked like in my head was very different from what was built post-1963. And they tend to look a lot like uh, the examples shown. Uh, next slide. So, well, a celebration of very uh, internationally infused influences, very flamboyant forms, highly defined yet very elegant geometries. And there was more to Malaysian architecture than just, well, uh, Malay steel houses and Chinese shop houses. Because it really was a celebration of international styles at the time. So next slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, when I was uh, designing the project, uh, I, I, I came across this painting, uh, which was done in, in the 80s. Um, and I really like this painting because the artist is providing a commentary on how modernity has crept into Malaysian ho households in the 80s. The painting is about a middle class uh, Malay household featuring Western-influenced objects around the house, depicting the adjustments of society towards newer tastes and behavior, so which was a very fitting reflection of the emergence of Malaysian architecture at the time, where it was full of borrowed influences, and it really tried to break away from tradition in a very vernacular manner. So next slide. So another very inspiring artwork uh, where there was a very innate tribal characteristic of community living depicted in this painting. So we can see villagers populating the outdoors, going about their daily lives, and has a very strong sense of community, which is a very key component in the way of life amongst Malaysians, which I think we yearn for belonging more than shelter. As we can see how the artist chose to emphasize the activities that are taking place outside the dwellings rather than the inside. So next slide. So what is Malaysian identity? Where do the paths of tribal community spirit, foreign influences, and identity meet? Was there something that all Malaysians could relate to? So, next slide. And there was. There's food. So, next slide. Uh, in many ways, food is the catalyst that make our society tick, breaking down all cultural barriers. So, when Singapore tried to claim that chicken rice and nasi lemak were theirs, uh, never have I seen more unity, I mean, next slide, and passion demonstrated by all Malaysians to defend themselves to the very end 
like we're fighting for something, uh, some kind of visible recognition because national pride was at stake. So next slide. Oh, I really like this. So whenever Singapore talks about their food, so Malaysians start talking on social media. Okay, next slide. So in all seriousness, food culture in Malaysia is a very unique medium to connect all Malaysians. And the eateries that serve these foods encapsulate the organic draw it has towards the common rakyat. If you go to a mama during some kind of inter international sports event that Malaysia is part of, you can see how they suddenly transform into from a simple eatery into an arena. And this is really shown, this really shows how much these places have become part of Malaysia culture. Uh, next slide. Uh, not only are they places to go eat and hang out, but they are also a large social condenser where people of all cultural backgrounds come and gather, which is a great example of unity in our nation. So next slide. Oh, I really miss this place, uh, Asia Cafe in SS15. Next slide. Next slide. So these are all examples of how, you know, the common Malaysians actually populate um, the open spaces with, you know, eatery. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so I attempted to diagram what a typical eatery in Malaysia would look like, be it a warung, kopitia, mawamat, and it looks a lot like this. Usually on the ground floor, spilling over onto the five foot way, right next to a bustling street, underneath an accommodation. And this somehow gets ingrained into our urban fabric, and I think we don't talk about it uh, as much, but I think we should celebrate this because it has become an organic, an organic point to meet for Malaysians, essentially forming a part of our culture and our way of life. So this is our identity. So next slide. So it seemed to me at the time that I felt the answer to all my inquiries, which I had uh, mentioned before, were very anti-architecture. So next slide. Surely if food was the answer to unity and Malaysians love dining and the mama stalls uh, next to five foot ways, that the hero here will be the tables and chairs. And for people, and, and for a while, uh, that was why I intended to submit actually, just tables and chairs. Uh, uh, and a large community table where people will come, sit down, eat and share a conversation. So next slide. So that was really what I intended to do in the beginning, because I think that was the solution um, uh, to the way of life uh, in Malaysia. And it really encapsulates the idea. So next slide. Yeah. Okay, next slide. So, and then I came across this beautiful quote by Peter Zomter in uh, 2011. So, it was an interview uh, with the zine talking about the design for the Serpentine Pavilion, which really inspired me going forward in the design process. So, um, what, is he, what, what he is essentially saying is uh, he created this garden in the middle with lots of uh, very unique species, and that becomes the centerpiece, and the architecture is just the frame. So it, the architecture acts as a stage and the courtyard garden at the center. Not you, not me, not anybody, but the courtyard, which uh, really resonated with me at the time. So next slide. Okay. So at this point, I knew I wanted two things, to bring people together and to ce celebrate our food culture. And that immediately formed the design principle moving forward which was to let the dining area take center stage and all the focus. Next slide. Yep, next slide. So these was just some excerpts taken from my uh, sketchbook at the time. So I, I really wanted to drive the principle of having the courtyard in the middle, and that becomes the focus and the stage, as uh, Peter Zomter has uh, described on his design. So I really wanted a large table under a big shed surrounded by food stalls, and I was basically configuring this from the typical street section. Uh, next slide. Next slide. And next slide. Next slide. A typical street section of an eatery to this, where all the emphasis is placed on the dining area. Uh, next slide. So I started to craft the mass of the building. Uh, next. Allow for a reasonable setback, which is the typical setback requirements in Malaysia. Uh, next slide. Adequate light and air. Next slide. Next slide. Providing accessibility to the courtyard. Next slide. And place the dwellings around the courtyard. So the hero here is really the courtyard and the dwellings just in the fore. 
Okay, next slide. An extensive patio to provide a secondary public domain. Next slide. And a huge inverted mansard roof uh, over to make it seem like it's floating atop the mass, which is a which is a way that I think a lot of uh, modern Malaysian architecture um, uses as a principle to make the feel the building feel very light. So next slide. So according to the Kazana uh, Research Institute, thirty percent of us Malaysians live in a terrace house, which is the most common type of housing in Malaysia. So what I did was uh, in the beginning. Um, I knew that, that this was something that Malaysians were very familiar with, especially a two-story uh, terrace house uh, and the spaces that are involved. So I took the generic layout uh, and tried to configure it into something a bit more civic, uh, like I mentioned earlier, where the dining area becomes the heart and soul of the building. So I also wanted it to be single story, so it's accessible uh, to the disabled and elderly. And I wanted a lot of in-between transitional spaces to break the monotony of a typical terrace housing block. Basically taking something that Malaysians are already accustomed to and turn it into something slightly more updated uh, to the current, current uh, needs of the people. So next. So next, uh, I created these fictional characters for my building uh, who would inhabit the dwellings. So I knew I was doing something about food and dining at the time. So I thought, you know, it would be very fitting to have chefs to come and occupy the living spaces. So they become the driving, uh, the, the engines that drive uh, the building. So uh, these chefs, uh, as I'll show to you in a short bit, uh, are born from different decades. So they are multi-generational and they come from different parts of Malaysia and are of different, different ethnic uh, uh, backgrounds. So you have Tok Taju, who's good with satay. He's a Thai Malay from uh, Kelantan, born in the 30s. So Mutu, who is a mama, who comes from Johor, born in the 60s. Very good with his uh, spicy vegan dal. Next. Uh, Nelly, who is a Peranakan from Malacca from the 80s. Very good with laksa and chendol. And uh, Bungun from Sabah, uh, who is very good with uh, teher teher, which is a Sabahan uh, dish for um, Sea urchin. And I, I really wanted to celebrate um, uh, these characters and, and bring them to, to the fore and uh, make, make them noticeable uh, and, and exhibit their, their, their culinary talents. So, um, and they all have very unique dishes, which are they're very good at, showcases their, their cultural heritage. And they're all farm to table chefs and they believe in harvesting their own ingredients herbs and spices, which they grow in their own allotments, which I'll show later on. So next. So I wanted a place of uh, vitality and to create something different while still not feel alien uh, to the human, human scale. So I also wanted to have a very strong connection with the outside. I think uh, uh, architect Lowe did elaborate on the importance of the connection to nature. And if there was one thing that uh, the lockdown has really taught me was while designing this was how much we took the surrounding environment for granted and how views towards nature really makes an impact on mental health. So I really wanted to blur the lines between the room and the environment as much as possible. And of course, a strong emphasis on building up community by having people close to the action to the chefs. So next. So this is the floor plan. So you can see um, uh, from, from this drawing that uh, there is a very strong emphasis a centric emphasis on, on the dining area. So um, as alluded to just now, uh, surrounding by the, the dwellings and the, and the patio, followed by the allotments, uh, individual allotments by the individual, individual chefs. Okay, next. So here's a blow up plan of how the spatial arrangement looks like. So as one enter the building, you'll be greeted by these allotments uh, maintained by the chefs. So in a way they're, they're your gardens which is a great place for them to grow their ingredients such as herb, herbs and spices. And the end of it, uh, so the ones towards the left, is a shed, which is an undefined space for the chefs to explore their hobbies outside of cooking, or to just simply gaze onto the gardens as a contemplative space. So the communal patio acts as a buffer into the main building where people can hang out with pleasant views outwards. So as you enter the main uh, dining courtyard, 
you will pass by Nelly's uh, Nyonya stall to the left and Taju's satay and tom yam shack on the right. So if you actually look closely into the drawings, I actually have uh, the foods on, on, on the kitchen counters. Uh, and their respective accommodations right behind them, uh, behind the wash counters. So next slide. So um, uh, the design of the dwelling is not complicated. It's, uh, it has a very modest built up of uh, 225 square feet, a comfortable size to fit the most basic necessities as I like uh, the chefs to spend a lot more time outdoors and in the kitchen, while still providing some room for customization. The openings are made of rotating screens, so the dwellers can customize their view and provide privacy when needed. Also, given the fall on the roof, it allows for good water collection opportunities, which can be used for gardening. Uh, next slide. So this is the approach uh, where the floor is covered in lush vegetation almost disguising the actual building due to its uh, single story scale. Where a large roof floats atop the four dwellings, the hint of life peering through the gangway between the dwellings, almost as if, as if it is cheekily giving a teaser of what's inside, generating intrigue. So next. So as you walk closer to the building, you'll soon see people lining up in front of food stalls, but the chefs busily take orders and start cooking. And after well, taking the order of your food, you will soon be greeted by this uh, huge courtyard. Next slide. With uh, other fellow food lovers sharing this large communal dining table, where the idea was for people to face each other while eating, instead of staring at their phones, uh, increasing the rate of social collisions and uh, interaction. So the table also features a herbs and spices garden where you could freshly pick your basils, your chilies, your scallions, and you can garnish your food. Also with the intent to create conversation with other people who are sat on the table. So next slide. So a view of the courtyard at night, um, at, le at least in my mind, where the courtyard is lit up and aromas of freshly cooked food fills the air. You hear sounds of walks, sizzling plates, ice blending machines and charcoal crackles, a bit like Asia Cafe, while people of all backgrounds congregate and share a plate of deliciously prepared local dish, sharing laughters, conversations under the night sky. So next slide. And that's how it looks like from the top. Next slide. So finally, I'd like to just close by saying this. Uh, we live in a highly polarized era where it is getting very tensed out there Politicians and leaders all around the world are making their followers pick sides and demonizing the people who oppose their ideologies. So toxic nationalism, racism, and all kinds of other isms are making global headlines again and, keeping, and are keeping our communities apart. And I think we all should just take a step back, grab a seat, order a tare, embrace our differences instead of magnifying them, stop buying the rhetorics that divide us, have actual human conversations, learn from one another, develop empathy, and I think architecture has, and design has a part to play in this. And that was the open house. And I hope I set out, uh, I hope I achieved what I tried to set out as objectives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lee Margie, for the fun and engaging presentation.